Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming here. Uh, this is my professional me, um, which you will never encounter ever again. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, the intentionality of Payne and Robert Kilworthy. Uh, as I just told you a minute ago, Kilworthy, 13th century, Dominican, weird theory of perception because he tried to put together Augustine and Aristotle. Um, how I'm going to talk about pain and its intentionality in Robert Kilwardby. First, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the contemporary stance on the intentionality of pain, uh, just so that we have an idea of how pain is treated today and how it differs from what medievals thought of it, especially Robert Kilwardby. And it also helps me to understand Robert Kilwardby's theory better because I'm, I'm asking new questions that usually the, the medieval philosophers don't ask and I find it good and challenging for the medieval text. Um, then I will talk about what it means or, or how, how Kilwardby explained pain and then we will try together to answer a few questions and Although there's sort of a dialogue on the third page of your draft that's not meant to be a real dialogue, as you can see from the lines, that's supposed to be part of our conversation after we, after I've presented you the stuff about Robert Kilwardy. <coughs> so, uh, first of all, so let's suppose that you wake up in the middle of the night and you're thirsty, and you want to go grab a glass of water, and you stub your toe on your bed. It really, really hurts, and you're experiencing that pain. But the problem is, or the question is, does that experience of pain, is that experience of pain also intentional? And one thing that I've noticed is that in, the contem in contemporary philosophy, the matter is not settled. There are those who say, oh yes, pain is intentional, it's an intentional state, and those who say, no, 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 how can you say such a such an appalling thing. Well, <laughs> the first ones who say that uh, pain is not intentional, actually, no, what, I'm, what I should tell you is that what I've noticed is that most of them, not all of them, but most of the contemporary philosophers tend to argue, to discuss about the intentionality of pain in terms, and to explain intentionality in terms of content. So whenever they describe intentionality, is a, a state, int intentionality is a state that is about something, that has aboutness, right? So it has a certain content because it's about an object. Well, why I'm saying that it's, it, they're focused on content, the, the question is, could it be focused on something else? And the thing is, if you look back at what Brentano said and how Brentano reintroduced intentionality, he said that a state is intentional when it is about something or it is directed at something. Well, the thing is that this <clears throat> directionality could be a different mark of intentionality. And this is actually, this might not be very clear at first sight because you would think, okay, if <clears throat> A state is intentional because it is oriented towards something. It has to be oriented towards a particular something. So it has to have a content as well. How could it be that a state is oriented towards something and no content is there? Well, the thing is, I think it's possible. And I think this is exactly what someone like Robert Kilwardby would say about intentionality. And it is actually not very far from what certain Cognitive scientists today would say, for example, I know he's not a great philosopher or anything, but uh, Damasio, when he's talking of the cells and how cells interact, he says that the cells try to keep, interact with, with um, external stimuli, he says that the, the cells try to keep their own integrity, their homeostasis. And they do so because they're sort of programmed to do so by, by evolution. And so whenever something from the outside affects them, they, they try to keep that homeostasis. And in that case, they, they act in a certain way, in an intentional way, but without a content. I'll get back to that when I talk about Robert Kilroy. So, 
as I said, what I've noticed is that most, most of the contemporary philosophers talk about content when they talk about intentionality. And they have a few arguments. Those who say that pain is not intentional basically say that what pain does, does not do, sorry, is that pain does not represent things in a certain way. And that an, another group of them say that there's a difference between the object and the experience of an object. And when I say that there's, there's a difference between the object and the experience of object, um, I mean, think, think of, the, of the pain. Whenever it is that I'm experiencing pain, what it hurts is not the experience of pain, but the sensation <clears throat> of pain. And so actual pain is not intentional because there's no, con there's no object there. There's no content. There's just me experiencing something. So this is one line of argument against um, intentionality of pain. And then they say, well, pain is not intentional because whatever intentional state is, it has to be a difference between appearance and reality. Now, this might seem to you to be similar with the first line of argumentation, but it's actually not. Uh, what it is is like, if I'm, let's suppose that I'm, I'm in a state of vision and I see something, uh, I can have a visual experience of something in front of me, even if that thing is not in front of me. <coughs> but it's not the same with pain. Whenever I'm experiencing pain, the pain has to be there. And since there's, since there's not, not this difference in the case of pain, they say, well, pain is not intentional, obviously. Well, on the other side, the guys who say that, no, no, pain is intentional, they say that pain represents what? It, it's, it's about something. It's about the part of the body that it's, it's hurt. So it does, it does have a location. It has an object. Or other ones, which are sort of closer to what Kilwardby would say, is that there's a match. I think this is called um, tracking inten in, intentionalism, uh, where they say that there's a match between the physical disturbance in the body and the the pain that we're experiencing. And this is really interesting, and we should keep that in mind, because we'll, as we'll see, this is something that happens in the case of Kilorgby as well. So just keep these two things, these two argumentation lines in, in your head, and I'll go to, I'll take a leap back in history in 13th century. And now there should be like medieval music in the background so that it's going to be a smooth transition, but <laughs> okay, um, as you can see on that draft, I, the example that I took is Kilwardby having a toothache because I suffered from a toothache this week and Nicola suffered from a toothache this week, so I thought, what a <laughs> better example. Um, right. Now my tooth hurts. <laughs> but it's fine. So let's, let's um, talk about how Kilwardby understood perception, because I think he would treat the experience of pain as a sort of perception, a perception in which, a, yeah, a perception in which we learn something about our inner world. And so it is a cognitive state. And well, if you go with Brentano's definition, all cognitive states are intentional. But as you will see, he, he's not really there yet. So let, in order to feel pain, you would need to, the, you'd need a disturbance in the body, right? And in order for a disturbance in the body to take place, you need a stimulus. So, I don't know if I should just... Can I just draw that? Because I am I feel more engaged than uh, Some of you know the scheme, so you might be like really bored of my schemes and of my Robert <coughs> Silverby schemes. I'm really sorry about that. But, um, 
let's say that there is a table. Oh God. Okay. Um, you, you, you're going to need to use your imagination here. Uh, this is a table. That's a table, by the way. And the table, <laughs> Robert Kilmer, you would say, emits the sensible species, which, as we all know, are the forms of objects, in, the case, in this case, the sensible uh, forms of objects. These are transmitted through the medium, which in this case is the air, and then they reach our sense organs, which in this case, oh my god, I wanted to, it's a, it's a foot with a toe. It looks like a boot, I know, but <laughs> it's not. And so this is the species which is transmitted through the air and it touches the, the sense organ, it reaches the sense organ. And so imagine this, my foot stubbing on the table. What you would expect, you would expect then and there to experience pain. Right? But Robert Trevor B says, no, 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 this is not when I'm experiencing pain. <coughs> no, because whatever it is that I'm experiencing, feeling, cognizing, is done not by my body, but by my soul. So, in a way, it, it, it sounds ridiculous, but your soul is suffering. It's not really your toe that hurts, it's your soul. Well, uh, this is really bizarre, and the reason for, for this is that he thought that there's an ontological difference between material and immaterial things. And here you have the soul. How should I represent the soul? Look, the artist. Okay. Like this? Okay. Probably not what you had in mind, but this is the soul. <coughs> well, this is the sensitive soul in this case. And what happens is I have this, this pain in my, in my toe, and in order to feel the pain, what Robert Kilwardby says is the soul needs to look and pay attention at the toe, and whenever the toe is affected, the soul sort of notices this. Okay. Why do you need this thing? Why do you need the soul paying attention to the body? Is because the body is ontologically inferior to the soul. And nothing that is ontologically inferior can act on something that is ontologically superior. So you would have some sort of a degree in the ontological um, superiority, let's say, of forms. Because you have this material form that is from here to here, all these material forms are ontologically inferior to your soul and of course your body and soul which are united and, but your body sort of it's elevated because of the soul, right? So since whatever comes from the outside cannot really affect, can only affect, it affects my body but it's not my body that sense, my soul that sense that for this reason, we <coughs> need the soul to pay attention to the body. This is along the lines of what Augustine said about perception. And, okay, so it pays attention. What it does is that it forms an image of the sensible species. So it forms an image, uh, an image, <laughs> this way. The thing is that, that don't, don't, don't make that face. I know it's weird. The thing is that it makes all of these images of all of the things that affect it. And it doesn't yet know or perceive them. Now what it needs to do is that it needs to reflect on itself, notice that something has changed in itself, so notice that it created one of these images, so what it's doing is just turning around and reflecting on itself and saying, ooh, I've got all of these images stored in myself. And I think I'm going to perceive one. So he's choosing one. He's becoming aware of its existence. And it's also becoming aware of itself as has, having formed this image. And then through this image, goes outside 
and recognizes the object, or in this case, goes outside, outside which is outside of itself, towards the, well, the part of the body that has been touched and that has been disturbed. So, now, one thing that you might wonder, not from what I presented you because it was too fast, but I'll give you a hint, <laughs> is how can the soul know which of these images to turn its attention towards and what thing to perceive? So if I'm having on this, this level, which is the material level, if everything that comes, everything that I'm encountering affects me, I normally, you would say, if you would go with, a, with Aristotle, for example, then you would have to perceive everything that affects you. But since things that come from the outside cannot affect you, then you cannot perceive any everything. So you only perceive whatever it is that the soul notices. So how does the soul choose this or that image to perceive? And here comes the intentionality, and this is why I would say that Robert Kilward's theory of intentionality would be in favor of things being intentional. Lost my track. Well, the soul, in order to perceive anything, needs to pay attention to the body. The soul pays attention to the body from the very beginning. It was designed so by God to pay attention to the body because it uses the body as an instrument for its pleasure. So it needs to keep the body intact. And from this point of view, the soul has a direction, is really oriented from its very beginning. It's oriented towards the body. Does it know the body? No. It doesn't know the body. It only knows the body after it performed this, this whole conversion and this whole thing. So you could say that this sort of intentionality that the soul has is being oriented towards, being open towards alterity somehow. So this orientation, this is its intentionality. And what I'm saying is that it is possible to think of a form of intentionality in which you do not yet have content. So you have the premises for the content. And of course, whenever you have intentionality, you will always have a content because you have this image and you have this representation that the soul form of the pain and of the disturbance of, of a certain part of your body. But in order to have that, so sort of the primary feature of your intentionality is always going to be this orientation towards. So, and this this is something that I think Kilwood and a lot of actually a lot of <coughs> medieval philosophers explain in terms of theology. Um, well, the discussion of theology is a bit complicated because whenever you talk about something being the the final cause of something, you need to have a cognizer, but I think in this case the cognizer can be God, so you still have theology in place. Um, right, so <laughs> how would you explain pain? I stub my toe, my soul forms an image of that disturbed part of my body, of my toe, that suffering, and it turns its attention towards this image. It turns its attention and uses it from all of the other images because that signals a disturbance in the body and the body needs its attention. So that's why I'm looking because I'm so, my soul is designed to do that, it's designed to, to take care of the body even though it doesn't know. So, it's so it, it acts blindly but it doesn't act blindly because it's it was made by a force God, the explanatory cause in the Middle Ages. But the, the idea here is that not even pain, which is like one of the most basic experiences that we can have, not even pain is, 
as a content at first when you talk about intentionality of pain. Because pain is, in the end, a state of our soul, and the soul is intentional, has a natural intentionality. So what you would see on that, um, on the scheme that I made there, is that there are two, two types of intentionality. And the first one I call natural intentionality, the one that goes from the sensory soul, which is actually the second one <laughs> on the scheme. And the second one is cognitive intentionality. And the difference between those two types of intentionality would be that in the natural intentionality, you do not have a content, but in the cognitive one, you have a content. Because you turn towards an image, blah, blah. Now, the thing is, if we were to look back, uh, to look at contemporary theories of perception and of perception of pain, um, I was wondering if we can talk about together and try to answer a few questions. And my, my questions all relate to the topic. together. My reasons are not completely non-egoistic. Uh, I should say I need to write a paper on, on this topic and I'm trying to find the best way to explain uh, Robert Kilroy's theory of um, intentionality of pain. In, in a, I'm trying to explain it in a way that would appeal to modern philosophers as well. So what I would like us to do is to, I'm just going to sort of put the questions out there. Then you're going to maybe ask me questions about Kilward and then we're going to try and answer them, if that's fine with you. Is it? That's good. So just to keep it and just to wrap it up, one thing that I see, and usually people in the contemporary philosophy interpret intentionality. So consider, so let's say, the mark of intentionality as being content while for Thomas Aquinas it wasn't content but it was directionality or openness or, um, yeah, directionality or openness. So you have these two. And that's the, the thing is, I think the whole, the sort of the first years, and not only, after Brentano reintroduced the concept of intentionality, things sort of, they misunderstood intentionality completely because they, they almost all of them, focused on the content <coughs> and sort of ignored the orientation and they thought that that's not possible. How, and I think in a way it's, it's like the normal reaction because if you think, I, I have a thought, if, you, if you're going to look at intentionality as a mental state, right, as they did, I have a thought and the thought needs to be about something but in order to be about something, it needs to have a content. I think I started with that, but I'm still not sure. Well, in any case, uh, these are two directions in which you can understand intentionality, and Kilroby would take the second route, the one with directionality, <coughs> and contemporary ones. Focus on content, and I said that like three times now, so thank you very much for your time, and goodbye.